well, the season of autumn went by so fast, and here we are in the Christmas season now, and uh, look forward to the Reverend Diane Stark, Unity Minister in the, the Muskegon Church, and uh, very much involved with the Coptic Fellowship. We welcome her back um, to present tonight within the Coptic family. On the Wheel of Fortune, Diane would be described as a combination of these archetypes, vagabond, earth mother, thespian, and healer. She spent most of her life working incognito as secretary, waitress, clerk, and cashier. She finally managed to gain legitimacy, graduating from Unity Institute of Religious Studies and being ordained in 2006. She has been the Unity uh, Minister at the Unity of Muskegon for the past eight years, and many theories of illusion versus reality have surfaced in cultures throughout history. What is the thread of truth in these philosophies? Why do humans think illusion? is a part of our experience. Uh, you can clarify your own notion of the nature of reality and see how the past may be influencing many of the, and may, may be narrowing your view. Uh, remove old blinders and that you may not even know you carry. That's some of the things that she will be talking about in a month. It's about uh, her life and what she's about now. And it's about touching on the Christmas spirit this evening. It's a wonderful topic as we enter into the month of December. I'm talking about the Christmas spirit tonight because there is this feeling, this energy that, um, you know, it sort of, it, it, it just hits you at some point during this time of year. It's, it's, it's irresistible. You know, you go into a store and there's just studded with rich colors and lights and, and, surprises and delightful things that you never thought you would see in a store that you just can't resist. Go for a walk in the woods and it's crackling, you know, with the showering of shedding old coverings and slumbering in the quiet of brown and white. And then imagine, you know, the way you're gonna celebrate the holidays Remembering the people who mean so much to you and whose friendships you treasure. And you want to remind them how much you cherish them and their friendship. And think of yourself making all the delicious treats you make and decorating all the spaces that are just actually now, maybe you've done it already, but have been utilitarian, but now you've made them spectacular and nostalgic. Does any other time of year do this to us? I, I don't think so. So to really invoke the spirit of Christmas, I thought tonight I would explore and analyze some of the traditions, you know, that have become part of the aggregate of the culture of Christmas that we now carry on every year. Like, for instance, the Nutcracker Sweet Ballet. We never, we never have the Nutcracker performed any other time but the holiday season anymore. It's become traditionally a part of Christmas celebration. And what I wanna do is look at the symbolic meaning of these different um, chunks of Christmas culture that have come to be traditional, that they come up every year and, and we revisit them. And they have deep meaning in them that I, I would like us to, uh, to really look at and, and, and become aware of. So with um, the Nutcracker Sweet Ballet, first of all, culturally, it's very inclusive. It's not anchored in Christianity per se. It's telling the story of customs practiced by a Christian culture, you know, family gathering, but the family gathering and the social mixing, the social celebrating, that is cross-cultural. That is a universal experience that everyone can identify with. So one of the wonderful things about the Nutcracker is that it's inclusive. It crosses all boundaries of culture and tradition and belief systems. And what it is, is simply a story about a young girl coming of age, coming into her feminine womanhood, 
because what happens in the story, if you don't realize it, you know, what happens in the story is that Clara is given a wooden handmade nutcracker by her uncle. But this nutcracker is in the form of a soldier. And something about the appearance of this soldier stirs her. It stirs her, I'll say it stirs her animus. It stirs her potential for coupling. And she sees sort of the echo of a romantic partner is, is drawn forth in her unconscious mind. She falls asleep on the sofa after the party's over. And in her dream, and probably in reality too, mice come in to the room and they start to rummage through the things and the food and the crumbs and everything. And the nutcracker appears as a young male soldier trying to defeat the mice. And he's losing, the mice are overwhelming, overwhelming him and whatever army he has. And so she takes her shoe and throws it at the, the mouse king and defeats the mice that's the she delivers the crowning blow and saves the prince and this brings her into equal partnership with this male figure and then they're taken to the land of sweets and they're honored as a couple by all of the quote unquote sweets from all of the different countries of the world that also is very inclusive, even though it's a caricature of all these countries, you know, it's, it's still, um, it's still broad and open and inclusive and honoring of a wide expanse of the world culture. So, um, and you know, Clara is just at the age of puberty. She's just arriving at the beginning of her true feminine womanhood. And um, and that's what the story is about. It's about a young girl who emerges into a new stage of development in her life. And it, it's studded with splendor and honor and sacredness of that next step of development. And so for that reason, I think that um, it is truly a marvel that this ballet has become you know, a, a, a really, you know, inseparable part of the Christmas celebration. Would you agree? Have I sold you on it? Did you, did you buy that? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what it means to me. I just love seeing the Nutcracker Suite at Christmas time. And then what's another, what's another one that everyone likes to visit at Christmas time or revisit is the Charles Dickens story of a Christmas Carol. Do, do you ever get tired of it? I haven't yet. I mean, the story of a Christmas Carol, you know, what a great soul Charles Dickens was to have conjured up a, 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 a catharsis for a whole, you know, for a whole culture to have the experience of identifying a grumpy man, a man who at, at the beginning, you know, he published it in, in serial form in England. And it, I mean, it sold magazines like crazy. People just couldn't wait to, to find the next part, the next installment of this fiction, of this story, this parable really of the human condition. And Charles Dickens was so, he was so astute at what he observed at a soul level of people. First of all, he set it up to, to show you that this Ebenezer Scrooge guy is detestable. You just really dislike him. He's so mean. He's so greedy. He's so uncaring. And then you're, you're taken as a witness to his journey, through his journey, where he's forced to look at his childhood. He's forced to look at the choices that he made in the past. But you, as the reader, as the observer, you have to change your heart towards him. You have to see 
why he has become the bitter, hardened, hard-hearted old man he has become. And you start to have sympathy for him. And he starts to see himself for the choices that he has made and the unfortunate results that he has created, he starts to see that. How cathartic is that? that? That's deep psychoanalysis, really. And then he's taken with the, by the ghost of Christmas present, he's taken to see the things that he's sacrificed, that he's given up, that he's um, denied himself, that he's cheated himself of, really. And the unfortunate results that he's creating in the future that, that could be tragic like with the death of Tiny Tim from not having enough resources in his life. So, so this three-part three um, story, the ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present, the ghost of Christmas future has engaged the imagination of so many storytellers, so many filmmakers. There's been many versions uh, made, uh, cinematic versions made of... Uh, the Christmas Carol, and um, my daughter was in a dinner theater production of the Christmas Carol that was written originally for the dinner theater with its own music and everything, and it was absolutely delightful. Um, all I can say is that it, it's become a Christmas um, extension, an extension of the Christmas spirit to to feed ourselves with this panorama of the lifespan, this man who experiences a huge shift and, an, and a transformational experience. And it's given to him by um, his old friend from beyond the grave, Charles Dickens. What a great invention of a story he gave us. Now here's a story. That was one of the, you know, Charles Dickens didn't just write one uh, Christmas story with um, episodic um, articles. He didn't just publish one time. There were a number of years succession in succession that he wrote episodes for a Christmas story for this publication. I don't know what it was in England. And uh, A Christmas Carol is kind of the one that emerged as the most notable. I don't even know if it's the best one because I haven't read them all. But I am familiar with another one of his um, Christmas stories, episodic Christmas stories. Have you ever heard of a story called The Cricket on the Hearth? Anybody? It's one of his stories. I saw a stage production of this story and it might be different from the actual story as he wrote it. But there's so much value in this story, The Cricket on the Hearth. It's a story about a 14-year-old girl who is blind. Her name is Bertha. And she is the daughter of a toy maker. Their mother, the mother has died. And the widower, he supports his daughter, his blind daughter, by making toys in his own little shop. And he tells her how wealthy they are and how lovely their home is and how many beautiful things that surround her because of his success and prosperity. And so at, at the point where um, he, it's Christmas Eve and he has gone out to make some deliveries, Bertha is left alone. And because of her blindness, she's familiar with the sound of this cricket on the hearth that's been there for the whole year, for the whole, since summer. And she hears that cricket on the hearth, that's that, that Christmas Eve night. And all of a sudden, the cricket on the hearth speaks to her and says, I will grant you one wish for Christmas Eve. And this wish can only last until, Chris, until Christmas comes. In other words, it's Christmas Eve and the wish will be over at midnight on Christmas. And so, of course, Bertha asks for her sight. She says, well, I would like to be able to see. You. And so for one hour, she's able to have sight. 
But with her sight, what she finds out is that her father has been lying to her this whole time. That actually they live in poverty. Their house is quite dingy. They don't have any luxurious items. <laughs> and at first she feels very betrayed, you know. But as she thinks about it, she starts to realize, well, actually it felt really good, the things that he was telling me. And, and then he comes home and she's confronted with him. She no longer has her sight, but she knows the truth and she knows the reality of their lives. And she knows where he's probably lying. And as the audience views this, they realize the, the tremendous irony here that they're seeing, that this, little, this, this young girl is realizing how much her father loves her. Rather than feeling betrayed, she feels love. And that's how the story ends. So, isn't that unique? I mean, have you ever heard a story like that anywhere? It's just, you know, it's just trans transcendent, I think. And last of all, okay, there's all these Christmas movies that we watch. And uh, I've got one that you probably never heard of. And I just want to sell it to you to watch this movie because this is the kind of a movie that has different strands of storylines going on simultaneously and you'll visit one part of one storyline and then another part. There must be a name for that in film school, what style of film that is. Does anybody know what it is? I don't. But anyway, one of the storylines in this movie, and the name of the movie is Noel. Anybody seen that? Well, it's a can't miss good movie because guess what? It stars Susan Sarandon, Alan Arkin, Paul Walker, Penelope Cruz, Robin Williams. Oh, I think that's it. Yeah. And um, one of the storylines is that there's this police officer played by Paul Walker. You may know who he is. Very handsome young actor. He passed away in a race car racing accident. He was in the Fast and Furious series of, of movies. Anyway, so handsome young actor plays the, the um, police officer who's engaged to a beautiful young lady who's um, probably a paralegal. She works with lawyers, played by the beautiful Penelope Cruz. But the police officer, his, his jealousy and possessiveness has caused such difficulty for this young lady, this young woman that... Um, she has told him that she can't marry him if he doesn't let go and not stop being so possessive. And um, he doesn't really understand, like, because when she says, you know, just because guys, you know, talk to me doesn't mean that you need to be jealous. And he, he, does, he just says, what guys talk to you? <laughs> so it's that kind of situation. So she says, I, I just can't go ahead with this if, if you're not going to let me breathe and let me have freedom. So he goes off to a cafe with his partner, his other police officer partner. And at the cafe, there's a waiter, an old man played by Alan Arkin, who comes up to him and says, oh, I was hoping I would see you this Christmas. And, and the police officer says, what do you mean? I don't know you. Get away from me. So long story short, the, the waiter, the old man, manages to follow him home to his apartment. The police officer knocks on the door and he opens the door. He says, you know, I told you to leave me alone. But the old man says, I just want five minutes. So he comes and he lets him come in. It's Christmas Eve. And, and the old man tells him that, you know, he thinks that Paul Walker is, is the incarnation of his ex, of his wife, his wife. And um, because of the color of his eyes or something. So Paul Walker, he says, you're crazy, man. And he chases him off. So while the old man is walking away, he collapses 
he has some kind of a heart uh, episode and he has to be taken to the hospital. So the police officer, Paul Walker's character, he goes with him just to look after him. But while he's in the hospital, sitting with the old man, his partner comes and says, hey, I looked this guy up and he spent four years in jail. He's got a, he's got a record. He spent four years incarcerated for involuntary manslaughter. Seems what happened, uh, he came home one night and found his best friend in the house with his wife and he assumed that they were doing something behind his back. And so he got into an altercation with his friend during which time he knocked him down and the friend fell and broke his neck and died. And his wife was so upset, she left the house, drove off in a hurt, in a huff and had an accident and was killed. And so every, and, and, and so that's what you're up against. So then the police officer starts thinking, you know, there's something going on here. You know, I got, I got to stick with this. Then the son of the old man comes to visit him in the hospital. And he says, ah, oh, did my old man tell you that story? You know, he thinks you're my mom's incarnation of my mom. And he said, yeah, he told me that story. He says, man, he does that every year, right about this time, Christmas time. He says, I'm sorry that you had to be bothered with this. So the police officer says, oh, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. I'm going to stick. I'm going to see this through. So the son goes off to get something to eat. And while he's gone, the, the old man starts to wake up. And the policeman goes over to his bed and he leans over to him and he says, uh, well, the old man says, why are you still here? I, I, I thank you for staying. And the officer says, listen, uh, I got something I want to tell you. Now I want you to listen to me. And he leans over and he says, I forgive you for everything. It's over. And he kisses him on the forehead. What a moment, eh? What a moment that, uh, and, and I'm telling you, I don't think my telling you in advance spoils it because I've watched this movie many times. Every time that moment comes, it's so beautiful to me. So beautiful. It just, it just somehow illustrates the oneness that there is among all of our hearts. So, and that's just one of the storylines in the movie. So I, I encourage you to, it's free, it's free on, um, on YouTube. It's called Noel, just spelled N-O-E-L. And there's other, other um, plot lines in the story that are equally uh, transcendent and mystical. It's really such a, an advanced, spiritually advanced movie, in my opinion. So I tell you that Christmas time is a time for extraordinary feelings of deep meaning. These are the gifts of a lifetime. This is why we can have Christmas every day. As Ebenezer Scrooge says, I will keep Christmas all year long because he had a deep experience of how precious and dear all of life is and how much we can give each other if, we'll, if we will only just do it. So thank you. Have a wonderful Christmas. Oh, wonderful. It's a wonderful life. It's, it's a <laughs> That's another one. That's I didn't want to harp on things that we all know too much all that well. <laughs> Made me think of all the the great Christmas shows that uh, really warm the heart and and the way you tell the story of of, of these incredible Christmas shows is is really special. So thank You're you. You're a very good storyteller. Well, I practiced, so thank you, because I really wanted to, <laughs> to I really wanted to deliver this to you. Mm -hmm in a way that didn't exercise you too much and wasn't too trite or hackneyed. Well, you okay. know, this is one of your callings. 
because not only as a minister, unity minister, you um, do like the arts and yeah. acting and singing and dancing. And so mm -hmm. it becomes you, my dear. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm not as light on my feet as I once was. <laughs> <laughs> You can only try to dance on our toes like the Nutcracker, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting, you know, uh, when I lived in Washington, D.C., okay, they have a ballet company there, the Washington Ballet Theater. And when I went, I actually went to back to live in Washington in 1980, having been in California for five years. And I was just uh, newly uh, single. And the first thing I wanted to do as a single person was go to that ballet. I'd never been to the Nutcracker. And I got tickets for my daughters and me and we went to the Nutcracker. Well, you know, in the Nutcracker suite, there's a, there's a dance called the dance, Ar the Arabian dance. Da, 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 da. <laughs> that, that number. Anyway, it's, it's usually done by, uh, as a duet, as a pas de deux. And this particular uh, rendition, I mean, every ballet is different. It's choreographed by whoever choreographs it. So this particular rendition was especially graceful and just, I, I, you know, it's just really memorable, just classic. And I've never, I've never seen anything as good since then as that, that particular uh, choreography of the dance, the Arabic, the, it's called a dance Ahab. So I come to Michigan and I meet up with Michelle May at our church who studied ballet all her life. And it turns out she was the critic for ballet at the Washington Post at that same year, on that same year that I was there. And she remembers it too. <laughs> she remembers that pas de deux from that ballet as being extraordinary too, so. That was pretty cool. Christmas stuff is very emotional. I was watching on PBS last night some music, Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin in the 60s, 67 and their families. It's just, you just want to cry. You know, I mean, it's just, yeah. you know, I mean, it's just, you miss all your old friends from those days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. The good old days, and they really were the good old yeah, days. Yeah, right. Everything was simpler and oh. whatever, right. And we were all and we were all younger. <laughs> really? really, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not smarter, but younger. I have a picture of myself sitting in Santa Claus's lap on oh. my phone. Wow! I'm going to show it to you now. Okay. Yep. I'm going to put the phone up because I just took a picture. I just found it recently. Oh, <laughs> Look at this. Oh, oh my goodness. Look at that little girl. You were uh, younger. <laughs> Five years old, 1950, 1950. It looks like a picture from a movie. It's so perfect. Yeah. How are you so, feeling with the Christmas spirit? Is it is it is it filling your heart? Are you are you enjoying the beauty and the spirituality of it all? I'm enjoying it. Yes, we're uh, enjoying it. We're loving it. Boys do. I've always wanted to go to a Christmas Eve midnight service. But I don't know if, if the Catholic churches are having one. No. I guess I have these illusions of grandeur, you know, snowing <laughs> outside and you're walking up to this uh, beautiful winter scene of the church and the steeple and all of the people. There are other churches besides Catholic that do it. I've been to Methodist churches that do it. At midnight, huh? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's, it's, very it's very moving in Chicago. We're having a candlelighting service at eight o'clock on the 23rd, because when you have it on Christmas Eve, so many people say, I can't come Christmas Eve, I've got plans. Right. And they backed it up one day. 
it's not midnight, but it's a nighttime candlelight. I'm not even going to have a theme or a topic. It's just about candlelighting <laughs> and Christmas, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'll be nice. And it's like you say, Nancy, people want that. They want this experience of, of a sacred, you know, mm -hmm. dark, quiet, candlelit mm -hmm. thing. There's a magic to it, I think. Mm -hmm. Eight o'clock on the 23rd, huh? Yeah. Well, maybe we'll be able to go. Love to have any of you. Maybe we'll get a Grand Rapids carpool together. Oh, that would be so great. <laughs> what are some of the Christmas songs that you all love? Name some of your favorite Christmas songs. Joy to the World. The Christmas song, White Christmas. Um, mm. I'll be home for Christmas. Oh, I love that. that. Oh, man. Silver Bells. I love to sing harmony with that. Mm -hmm. Rudolph. Rudolph. Yeah, Rudolph. <laughs> what about, what about have yourself a merry little Christmas? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I like that one. Is it White Christmas one of the most loved ones? I'm, yeah. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Oh, oh yeah. I think it always comes out high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I am I think, dreaming of a white Christmas. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I think it's a special honor for any song to be included in, you know, the, the, those songs that we play because, because not all songs make it into the, the, you know, like white Christmas that wasn't around around mm -hmm. 1900 they didn't have that but it's become part of our christmas culture even, even if you live in california they like it <laughs> yeah I, I love the song that yoko ono and john lennon recorded so you say this is christmas you know happy christmas war is over mm -hmm. yeah that one i mm -hmm. love that mm -hmm. that was so really advanced wasn't it spiritually forward. I saw Mama kissing Santa Claus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm getting nothing for Christmas Yeah, because I ain't been that bad. <laughs> yeah, I know that we all have uh, memories of how Christmas Eve and Christmas were all special to us individually. And um, it's just a wonderful memory to have. Remember it every year, you know? I remember my favorite gift as a kid. Do you remember that? What was it? It was a red crew neck sweater. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Very much in, in the 50s or 60s, whatever it was. Right? Mm -hmm. My father would, we didn't have television um, in the early 50s. And so for the two weeks at Christmas time, um, mom and dad would rent a TV. Wow. And, and set it up. And wow. boy, that was a big deal, you know, because uh, we wanted to watch the Rose Parade and um, on New Year's Day. Rent a TV, wow. Mm -hmm. Was it black and white or in color? Black and white. <laughs> yeah. Mean. And it was probably a small screen too, you know. <laughs> yeah, several years ago when the Lord of the Rings series finally came out, when the last one, the last extended version came out, Lynn and I planned to do a movie marathon on a New Year's Day. And we looked into renting a large screen TV just for the one day. And it was going to cost so much, we decided to just go out and buy one. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Good choice. How big a screen did you get? Uh, it was probably around 
in the mid 30 inch, like 35 inch, 32 inch, something yeah. like that. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't super huge, but it was big for what we were used to. Mm hmm. You know, it's seven o'clock, guys. It is seven o'clock already. Are we going to turn into pumpkins? <laughs> <laughs> or the Grinch? I think everyone's basking in the warm glow of the Christmas spirit. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. A lot of memory. Like you. I I wanted. Wanted your presentation, Diane. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I was so delighted that the way it came to me and I was happy to give it.